Okay, folks. Uh, I think we'll uh, I think we'll start uh, start now. If anyone else joins us after this, uh, um, they'll, uh, they'll have to play catch up on their own. Um, I think you guys all know me. My name is Nick Hume. I'm a provincial staff officer here in uh, here in BC, attached to Division One Seventy Six. Uh, joining us tonight to uh, to teach us all about bones in the skull system is David Brown. Dave's uh, uh, also a member of Division 176. He's a primary care paramedic and uh, an emergency medical dispatcher. Um, our usual rules uh, or requests throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, presentation tonight, folks, uh, please keep your cameras and microphones uh, on mute and cameras turned off uh, throughout our presentation this evening. This just helps uh, remove some distractions from folks, especially in the recorded sessions. Uh, this will be up on YouTube in the next uh, uh, the next hopefully day or two. Uh, sometimes it gets me a takes me a couple days to get everything edited and stuff. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, Dave, I'll let you uh, build in any breaks where you want them. So if people have questions, please type them into the Zoom group chat. And uh, what will happen is uh, Dave will read them out or I'll curate them a little bit and, and feed them over to Dave um, at sort of appropriate, uh, appropriate moments. It's just a little bit easier to keep track of the conversation that way. And um, with that, I'm going to hand you guys over to uh, to Mr. David Brown to teach us about bones in the skeletal system. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Nick. So for those of you who don't know me, as it's Nick said, my name is David Brown. I'm a paramedic with the ambulance service. Um, and we're here to talk about bones tonight. So as I'm calling it tonight, bones, how the heck do they work? And alternately, one hour of me talking about the greatest show that ever happened on Fox that's been cancelled entirely too early. Uh, so tonight we're not going to talk about that show, sadly, but if you'd like to discuss it in line with me later, please let me know. I'm here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what bones are. We're going to talk about some functions of the bones and skeletal system. There's a few in there that a lot of people aren't as familiar with. We're going to talk a bit about the structure of bones, how bones form and repair. We're going to talk about some interesting bones along the way. It's worth noting in this class it's not going to be much about fracture management it's not going to be a lot about or there's going to be nothing about splinting and slinging largely just because those are very hands-on topics they're discussed in the mfr and we're really trying to add that level above the mfr right now so similarly none of this is information that you will have learned in the mfr and none of it's information you have to know but i think it's a really interesting balance of everything mixed in there uh, so first off we're going to just start with the basics what is the skeletal system this, it's a system of bones. So the human body has, or the adult human body has 206 bones all spread throughout. It doesn't include any muscle or connective tissue. So it's just the bones that are part through there. So what do bones and skeletal system do within our body here? They do a lot of things. They protect our internal organs and structures. So especially up into the chest, your ribs, your sternum, your and your uh, pelvis all help protect a lot of the very delicate sensitive structures in within there. Similarly, muscles actually attach to the bone. And so the bones give the muscles something solid to pull against. So all that would happen is if you didn't have bones, you just have a floppy noodle expanding and contracting. Whereas the bone, like for example, your bicep muscle inserts up here, and then that's what it pulls on. And I'm not flexing because it's not worth me flexing. Don't worry. Uh, it supports the body as well. So similarly with that big floppy noodle, we'd be without bones in there. Uh, the skeletal system also helps support the body, hold us all up, hold all the soft tissues together. Um, other things that are a little less commonly known is it's uh, the site of blood cell production all throughout the body. So red blood cells, white blood cells, um, and platelets are all formed actually in bone marrow. Uh, fat storage is a huge, like, our body uses triglyceride type fats for a lot of things all throughout the body. And a lot of it's stored in adipose tissue or fat tissue throughout the body but a much more rapidly available source of fat to the body is gonna be in bone tissue. And then also helps control calcium and to a lesser extent other minerals throughout the body and the levels of that mixed in. I'm just seeing some stuff happening in the chat right now. Oh, Nick there, perfect. Uh, so types of bones. So we classify bones into four different types. There's long bones, short bones, flat bones, and irregular bones. So long bones are what most people think of when they hear about bones. It's bones with a shaft and an end. Uh, so that's gonna be big ones, like your humerus and your upper arm, your radius and ulna, uh, but that also includes your metacarpals in your hand, your phalanges in your fingers. 
but it's really any bone that looks like that sort of stereotypical classic bone. Uh, we have short bones. So those are bones that are roughly tube shaped. Uh, so in the, this is image here is showing the wrist. So you can see the radius and the, ul or the radius and the ulna coming up. And then there's a number of bones in the wrist here that connect between the radius on the ulna and the hand. So you've got bones like your scaphoid, your lunate, your trapezium, trapoid, capate, hamate, pisiform, all those bones in there. Uh, there's a huge number of bones in the wrist and hand as well as a huge number of bones in the ankle and foot. I think it's something like 106 bones just in the arms and legs and then the other 100 bones are everywhere else to the body. There are also flat bones. So these are thinner and protective bones. Um, they're fairly, again, thinner, flatter. Uh, most of the bones in your cranium, so your the upper part of your head that encases the brain are considered flat bones. Your ribs are considered flat bones. Your pelvis is considered flat bones. And then there's irregular bones, which is just sort of a catch-all term for everything else. Uh, so in this case, some examples are going to be vertebrae. They're just so irregularly shaped, they don't classify well within there. This is a zygoma on the face, so one of of these bones here, this is coming up into the eye. Those are our types of bones there. Um, so a little bit about structure. How, how are bones put together? What do we call different parts? Uh, so we're gonna be tar starting talking mostly about long bones for the structure because other types of bones don't follow quite the same rules. But typically it's split into a few different parts. So we can see the oh, ep epiphys, epiphys, I can't. Epiphysis, epiphysis uh, up in the end. So that's going to be the essentially the ends of the bone, so the top and the bottom there. The metaphysis is going to be the area that links the diaphysis and the epiphysis. And that's also going to be known as the growth plate. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then the diaphysis is the shaft of the bone or the main length of it. And the met metaphysis contains the epiphysis. Ep Ephesial plate, really should have practiced pronouncing these beforehand, uh, which is also known as the growth plate. Uh, there's a few other structures in the bones that we want to just point out. Uh, inside of the bone is the, the medullary cavity. That's where all of your bone marrow is going to exist. So that's a tube essentially running roughly right through the center of the bone. And then out on the ends of the bone, where they actually contact other bones and participate in joints, there's something called articular cartilage, which is just a layer of chondrocytes and, our, and cartilage cells. It's a very thin layer, but it just helps take some of that wear and tear and provides a little bit of shock absorption for the bones. There's a few other things labeled on here as well. We don't really need to know most of them. Um, the endostem is the or sorry, the endosteum is the layer of bone forming cells that runs on the inside of the medullary cavity. The periosteum is a layer of spongy bone that exists around the outside of all of the bone as well. Uh, inside our bones, we'll find bone marrow, and there's actually two types of bone marrow. Uh, so our first type is gonna be yellow bone marrow. It exists in the medullary cavity. It's the source of tri triglycerides and fats, and it's our primary storage within the bone there. Then we also have red bone marrow. So in long bones, it's going to be present in the epiphysis, ep, 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 the ends of the bones. Um, and that's actually the primary site of blood cell production within the body. So as we mentioned earlier, that's where we create most of our white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. So red marrow is present in the ends of bone and the ends of long bones, as well as in a lot of these more irregularly shaped bones. I'll just pause there really quickly if any questions have come up there, Nick. It doesn't look like it, so we will move forward. This isn't going to be a super long talk tonight. There's only so much we can talk about bones without getting a little boring. Not that we're there yet. Um, so we're going to talk next about just two types of cells that exist in bones, and there's like a few more, but we're, they're not particularly relevant to our talk tonight. I didn't really want to go into cells that much. So there's osteoblasts, and those are the cells that actually help form bone at a basic level. So what they do is they secrete what's called an extracellular matrix. So it's a network of fluids, proteins, and minerals, and it creates this fluid that then be, that can solidify into bone. 
And what these brave little cells actually do is essentially mop themselves into a corner with this matrix. So they just run around secreting matrix until they kind of get stuck and can't go anywhere else. And then as they die, they ossify and turn into bone tissue. They do more and more of those. And there's also osteoclasts, which also, which actually break down bone extracellular matrix. So they break down all the layers of bone around there. And that helps for regeneration, which we will also talk about a little bit later. Uh, there are other types of bone cells too. There's osteoprogenitors, which are like almost a stem cell for bones. A uh, very simple cell that can differentiate and a few other types there, but we won't dig too deep into it. Uh, so bone formation. Um, I do really try and avoid using like copyrighted imagery or um, imagery with watermarks on it, but this picture just seemed to be a little too perfect. Uh, so as we mentioned before, there's uh, ossification is the process of bones being formed. And there's two types of bone formation. Um, so there's intramembranous, intramembranous ossification and endochondral ossification. We're just going to go really quickly through both of them. Um, these are gross oversimplifications for them. And most people, anyone who's studied any of this at a, any real level beyond what I have will probably have feelings about what I'm about to say. Um, so intramembranous ossification, it's how we form most of our irregular and flat bones. And then we'll talk a little bit later about bone development. But at once babies exit the womb, they come out not fully stuck together. And so this is also the process that's followed for a lot of bones diffused later in life or early in life once babies are born. So mesenchyme cells are very broad cells that can essentially become almost any other type of cell in the human body. So they cluster in where bones are going to be formed, and then they become osteoblasts, so cells that create bone. Those osteoblasts then lay down a lot of mineral salts and especially calcium ions that are required to foam, form bone. And what, as it lays those down, they then again, paint themselves into that corner filled with extracellular matrix, mineral salts, calcium. And then as they die, they solidify and help os and ossify and help turn into bone there. And as they start to form bone, they create these interconnected matrix and it's called trabeculae. It's, uh, I was trying to find, I don't know if I have a picture of it in here, uh, but we see this interconnected web of tubes of bone all reaching together. And this is how most of the same, these irregular bones are formed. So it's a, it almost looks a bit like a sponge. And then inside that sponge, uh, it's filled with blood vessels. And then a lot of the mesenchyme cells that are left over from this process then differentiate themselves into being bone marrow. So our next type is endro endochondral ossification. And this is really a common type for most of our long bones. So what happens is as the fetus is forming, they need a bit of a structure just to build everything inside. And so they're not really able to just slowly work on forming bones. So what they do is first these mesenchyme cells cluster and then they become chondrocytes or cartilage cells. And what they do is they create what's called a cartilage model exactly of where the bones are going to be. So relatively early on in development, um, these, these fetuses have essentially a cartilage bone structure, or cartilage skeleton. And then as they grow and as they develop in the womb, the cartilage is actually replaced by bone from the outside in. So most of the time this happens in the long bones. There are a few other ones there. So once, uh, once babies are born, they do start to grow. Like people, you know, bones are not the same length from the moment we're born until the moment we die. They grow in length and they grow in width. So that's where we have the epi 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 epiphyseal plate, uh, which is also called the growth plate. And it's actually made up of cartilage. And so as we can see in this picture here, that's so helpfully labeled, there's the diaphysis, the main body of the bone. Then we see the growth pl plate and then the epiphysis of the bone. And so the growth plate sits right in the middle and it's not actually made of bone, it's made of cartilage cells and those are constantly dividing. And so as those cartilage cells divide, it's constantly creating more and more and more and they slowly die off. And as they die, they're deposited onto the bone and then the bone Essentially, they ossify and also turn into bones. They slowly stretch out that way. So that's how those grow in life. Um, this happens pretty much from the moment of bone formation up until roughly the age of 25. 
Uh, most growth plates are sealed or calcified before then, but there's a few uh, that keep growing right up until the age of 25. Um, so bone remodeling is also something that's constantly happening within the body. Um, so this is how old bone cells, potentially aged bone cells, bone cells that are functioning as well as they can are broken down and replaced by new bone. So the osteoclast cells come in and break down the old bone. That releases that minerals and collagen back into the body. And then as soon as those come through, osteoblasts come back through and lay down new minerals and collagen. And so these two processes are very closely balanced as they're working their way through bones. And so a lot of the times, some of the diseases will see something like bone spurs or when osteoclasts maybe aren't working as effectively as the osteoblasts. And so osteoblasts don't have space within the bone matrix to replace. So they just start creating new bone on the outside of the bone or other areas where there shouldn't be. And um, similarly, in some bone cancers, it causes excessive action of the osteoblasts. Or similarly, you can have osteoclasts that become overactive that start breaking down bone tissue faster than osteoblasts can build it and add it, which can start to cause very weak bones in there. Uh, the other interesting thing is this is a huge part of how our body regulates the calcium levels within the blood. Um, so there's a lot of systems, the heart, uh, nerves, parts of the brain, all rely on a very consistent, very steady level of calcium being circulated through the blood. And the main source of calcium in the blood comes from the bones. So as the osteoclasts break down the old bones, one of the big things it's doing is releasing that calcium back into the body. And so as our body goes, we have several hormones, um, including the parathyroid hormone, which actually regulates the speed at which osteoclasts and osteoblasts work. So if the body starts to recognize that it's getting too, like its calcium levels are becoming too low, it'll actually signal and cause osteoclasts to break down bone more effectively, and it'll cause the body to build more osteoclasts. So that way it can release more, more um, calcium into the body. Um, it's simply it can signal for osteoblasts that the calcium levels are becoming too high, which can also become quite dangerous for the heart. It can signal for the osteoblasts to start creating more bone, more new bone that's going to stay longer in there. So while the body is um, building new bone, one of the things it also has to contend with with fractures. So when the bot when a bone is broken. And some of the cells on the ends of the fracture do simply die just through the process that they're cut off from their nutrient supplies, they're cut off from blood flow, they're cut off from everything they need to survive. So first, a lot of the, what are essentially cleaner cells or phagocytes go in and just break down the dead bone around the fracture. And then cartilage or chondrocytes can form much faster than bone can. So the chondrocytes go in and actually form essentially a bridge between the two bones, linking them with calcium or sorry, linking them with cartilage, and then that creates essentially a little splint. And then similar to the bone formation that we just talked about, the osteoblasts then come in and slowly replace that cartilage bridge with uh, bone tissue. Uh, so I'll just pause there if there's any questions about uh, bone formation. We're moving pretty efficiently through this. It won't be too long in the talk tonight, I don't think. All right, we're either going totally over your heads or just nobody's paying attention. Um, so move on to different types of fractures. And so this may be something you've covered within um, the MFR level. I've never actually taken an MFR course, so I can't comment too particularly about that. Uh, but we're gonna show some x-rays here um, and look at different types of fractures. So we talk a couple different ways. We talk about partial versus complete fractures, we talk about open versus closed fractures, we talk about displaced or non-displaced fractures, then we'll talk about a couple other weird ones at the end. Uh, so first off, we have partial or, com partial or complete fractures. So a complete fracture, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, this goes all the way through the bone, whereas partial fractures don't break the entire bone, so it would just go halfway across. So we're gonna ask the chat, because I need participation now, which type of fracture is shown in the picture? There we go, that's a complete fracture. Um, so next we talk about open and closed fractures. So open fractures are where the broken end of the bone actually protrudes through the skin. 
and closed fractures are when the bone stays inside the body. So it's maybe not as clear, but we can see in this picture, the bone here is actually protruding through the skin there, which is right around here. I don't know if our resident former radiologist is here tonight, um, and I'm sure he can tell me why I'm wrong about this. Um, it's just worth noting open fractures absolutely must go to the hospital because they will like most likely be receiving a course of antibiotics for it. Uh, when structures within the body that deep to get down to a bone have protruded through the skin, it means there's a really high likelihood of bacteria, dirt, worms, anything like that getting inside the body there and potentially causing infections. So it's very important when someone's experienced an open fracture like that, they need to be going to see the emergency department. Uh, so displaced and non-displaced fractures. Uh, displaced fractures present where the two ends of the bone are misaligned. So if a bone fractures there and they're still together like this, then your bone fracture is non-displaced. But if they're sitting like this, then it's a displaced fracture. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, a lot of the time what we'll see with this is going to be you know, a very clear indication it's going to be shortening. Um, so I broke this wrist quite badly a few years ago and I displaced the radius bone here. And so my whole arm was shortened on this side. And the same we'll see in this picture here, like this is a femur that connects the hip to the knee and it's displaced. So this leg will likely be, appear to be quite a bit shorter than the other legs. So that's a very clear sign typically of displacement. Uh, green stick fractures, these are most common in children and they're caused by the force coming in the bones sideways instead of straight on. Uh, children's bones are softer, a little bit more pliable, um, but what'll happen is as it goes sideways, instead of cracking the bone across, it'll essentially just splinter the bone. Um, if anyone's ever like pulled a stick off of a tree and just had parts of the tree split off that way, that's a green stick fracture. Uh, they're most common in children. There's a very helpful arrow to the picture in this one here. I've seen some much more spectacular pictures before, but I couldn't find a really good one for this presentation. Um, and as I said, they're most common in children just due to the less for development. Uh, growth plate fractures can also happen there. So there's areas right in around the growth plate that can be fractured, especially in the wrist is not uncommon in children while it's still a softer area. And so the concern there is as the fracture heals, they're going to get all these calcium and bone deposits in around an area that's supposed to still be growing. And so it can cause a poor growth of that bone moving forward. Uh, so I'll just pause there if there's questions about fractures, anything like that, and then get a little bit of water in again. All right, nobody wants to talk to me tonight. That's just fine. Um, don't worry, you're almost free of my time here. Uh, so we're going to talk about some important bones. Uh, these are presented in no particular order, but these are just some bones that either I think are interesting or I think there's useful things to know about. Uh, so first is the femur. The femur links the pelvis to the knee. It is your largest, longest, and strongest bone in the body. Um, so we can see on here, though, there's this... Sorry, can you see my mouse on the screen here, guys? Anyways, yeah. I'm going to hope you can. Yes, we can. Perfect. Thanks. So this, this here is the head of the femur, and this part here is the neck. So if you can imagine, the head of the femur connects into the pelvis and then s extends outwards towards what you would call your hip bone and then drops down. And that's actually a very common point that can be fractured in, in elderly people. Um, so a lot of the time what we'll see is that neck of the femur is actually what's broken when people call it a hip fracture. A lot of folks seem to think that it happens in the pelvis, but seeing the fracture of the neck, the neck of the femur is very common. And that's also the area you'll see a lot of the time folks will have replaced in the artificial hip. So the, ne the neck of the femur and the head of the femur seat into the acetabulum of the uh, pelvis. And so, but typically it's the neck of the femur instead of the uh, acetabulum or the receiving part of the pelvis there. And the skull, uh, lots of people have talked about the skull before in several different presentations. I'm just going to mention, it's made up of a lot of bones. 
Uh, a lot of people do seem to think it's only made up of a few bones there. And so the only part I'm going to hit on here is most of the time, these cranial bones, so in and around the brain, are not connected. So we can see along here, there's all these sutures that run all across the body, or pardon me, run across all the way across the skull. And those are where the different bones link together. And so when babies are born, they're born without those sutures. They're born with, born with those bones just moving freely because it makes it easier for them to shrink down to fit through that birth canal there. Um, so what we see then is, as we mentioned, oh, there we go, put it back to the skull. So babies are actually born with around 300 bones in their body. So all over their body, there's several more divisions. And then as they reach um, adulthood, you get down to 206 bones. So we see these, this process of ossification happening all across the body. But the prime example of it is in, in the cranium where you get uh, like the soft areas on small babies, especially at the top of the head, the fontanelles that slowly solidify over time. And the same, all these sutures across the skull ossify together and connect. Uh, another interesting bone is the pelvis. Um, again, it's actually made up of really two bones, um, but there's the two bones that reach down around through the back, and then they're connected up here at the sacrum. Um, this is another bone. It's not fully fused as the child. They form fold inwards a little bit, but then fuse quite quickly after they are, uh, after babies are born there to try and create some extra shape there. And the other big one is this is one of the only bones that has a significant difference between men and women. And the big difference is to accommodate childbirth. So as we can see here in women, uh, it's typically a much larger oval opening towards the center here. And the coccyx, which is the lowest part of the spine, is almost straight down and backwards. Whereas in men, it bends forward much more in towards the pelvis. There's typically a much smaller opening here. And then to these angles here at the base of the pelvis, a uh, woman, it's open much wider and men, it tends to be much narrower. Um, it's one of the key ways that they'll use a lot of the time when they find uh, human remains that are just skeletons. It's an easy way for them to typically be able to tell the sex of the individual that they've found there. Um, my last bone that I threw in here, just as an interesting one to throw you a bone, uh, is the stapes bone. So it's actually the smallest bone in the human body. It exists inside the inner ear. Uh, this is one on the tip of somebody's finger. You can get a sense of just how teeny tiny it is there. Um, just quickly mentioning as well, osteoporosis. It's a fairly common disease in a lot of elderly folks, uh, but bone doesn't form as densely or flexibly. And so typically what it means is as available mineral levels within the body start to decrease, the body just can't create bones with nearly the strength or flexibility as before. And so it leads to very weak, brittle bones. And so it means a lot of the time elderly people are much more at risk of falling, much more at risk of fractures, injuries that way. So with a half hour there, that's about all I have added there. Uh, any final questions there? I've seen one in the chat here with Nick. Um, so, so we had one person ask, does the body have a way to naturally heal displaced fractures or is surgical realignment the only way? Uh, that's a great question. And surgical, sur that's a surgical matter there. Um, I believe t most of the time, a lot of the time, uh, that would likely have been a fatal injury simply because people wouldn't be able to walk or wouldn't be able to use their arm again. Um, your body actually in some ways will make it much worse. Um, it's a big issue, especially in wilderness medicine or something like that, like a displaced fracture, especially something on a long bone. What your body does is it naturally tightens the muscles around a fracture to try and splint it and hold it together. But when there's only the one bone, so for example, a humerus or a femur, a lot of the time, even the fracture itself will only be displaced by a small amount. But then as those muscles contract to try and splint it, it'll draw those further and further towards each other. And as it pulls them along, it tends to do more and more damage inside there, especially when we consider that there's some fairly large blood vessels that run along the femur. Another, there's an artery that runs right along here, your brachial artery it just creates a higher and higher risk of those being damaged, um, which is why we'll see consideration of traction splints at higher level of care a lot of the time. So even you'd see sometimes the old, you know, old timey movies, people would just be reefing on somebody's leg to try and get it put back together. Um, 
I don't know as much about arthritis as I probably should do. My understanding is there's a little bit to do with um, like a lack of synovial fluid lubricating joints. But beyond that, it's, it's not something I can talk about confidently enough to give you a great answer there, I'm afraid. We'll give people a few more minutes here to put questions in. Just while we're doing that, I'll throw in my shameless plug as usual. Um, this has been part of our uh, weekly lecture series that we've been doing almost every week. Uh, they're happening every Monday night. Um, if you guys do want, got into this by accident or you want links sent to you for these YouTube videos that we're posting, just send down an email. There's links at the bottom there. Or you can also reach out and follow us. Oh. You can also reach out and follow us on social media there if you want to see what we're getting up to, especially as we get back into maybe looking at doing duties again in five or six months. We're getting close to every moment there. There was just a really quick uh, addition there, Dave. Uh, someone, if you go back to that social media link page for a sec or, or splash screen, um, that at SJAVICBC, I haven't actually added the YouTube logo yet, but that does work to find us on YouTube as well. Um, so if you're uh, if you're trying to find recordings of any of the previous um, Monday night training sessions, uh, you can go there. We do have uh, nearly every training session that we have offered online is recorded there. Um, there's uh, there have been one or two notable exceptions from presenters who uh, presented content that maybe wasn't suitable to share with the broader public, but for the most part, uh, everything uh, everything you've been able to watch with us uh, is available there. Well.